So you have know, there's about 650 prayers recorded in both the Old Testament and New Testament. We're not going to read them all out this morning, but someone must have sat there and counted them. I didn't. So uh, the, you know, the question is: Are the prayers in the Old Testament the same as the prayers in the New Testament? Should we you know, follow the Old Testament model or the New Testament model? What about fasting? We're going to talk about fasting today. Did God answer prayers in the Old Testament? So we're going to go through a few verses and talk about that this morning. Now, prayer in the Old Testament. Prayer didn't really start till after the fall. Now, because Adam was in the garden and he fellowshiped with God in the, in the cool of the day. So God was with him the whole time. There was no sin in the garden to separate Adam from God. So, so God didn't need to have prayer to God because God was there with him all the time. All his needs were met. All his food was supplied, so he didn't need to ask for food. There was um, you know, friendly, um, friendly animals. There was no enemies in the garden except one. But this all changed when man sinned and was thrown out of the garden. He had to work hard. That takes prayer sometimes. <laughs> There was, um, there was enemies all around him, wild animals. There was climate change after the fall. Man needed a way to contact God. Most prayers in the Old Testament were, were intercessory prayers, praying for other people. That was the main prayers in the Old Testament. And not, not everyone could pray in, in those times. You know, the Holy Spirit is so important in prayers only kings and prophets and priests and judges had the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would come and go on them anyway, you know the normal person you know the normal Joe didn't have the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament so the, and, and the Holy Spirit helps us in prayers so, so the people would come to the kings or the prophets or the priests and ask them Things to, and they would pray to God. They would intercede on their behalf. And a, a, an example of that is in Two Chronicles twenty about King Jehoshaphat. Do you know uh, King Jehoshaphat was the king of Israel, and all these armies came against him. And in ver, uh, Two Chronicles twenty verse three and four. It says, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord through, through the king, because the king was going to pray. In verse 5, then, um, then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God, our fathers, are you not God in heaven, and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? In your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to stand against you. King Jehoshaphat was praying to God on behalf of the people. They came to him for prayer, and he, he interceded on their behalf. Notice he started off the prayer with praise. He prays to God, God, you are this, you are that. Yeah, that's a good example to us today. Is, is, you know, your prayers, you know, start off with praise and worship to God. Tell him who he is and what he means to you. Now, praying, praying under the old covenant versus the new covenant. Now, the old covenant prayer was more of a struggle for the people in those days. And you say, well, why is that, Pastor David? The Old Testament saints, the Old Testament saints, did not have access to the name of Jesus. That's that's New Covenant. Only kings, prophets, and priests and judges had the Holy Spirit to help them in prayer, and then He would come and go anyway. The ordinary person did not have the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament saints had had more of a struggle with demons in those days than we do or should. Jesus died, descended, defeated and rose victorious over death, the devil and hell. He stripped the devil of all his power. 
Whereas in Old Testament times, you know, the devil was he was in the gardens. He started off the garden, and he would uh, he tried to, tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. He was there all the time. So we do not and should not have to um, have that same st- uh, struggle with demons that they did in the Old Testament. Now, the, the, the Old Testament saints also employed you know, the use of fasting in their prayer life. They fasted a lot, prayer and fasting in the Old Testament. Uh, and it was, a, it, was, it was an ordeal to fast for days and they you know, put sackcloth on them and all this sort of stuff. So it was a real struggle to pray in the Old Testament. Excuse me. It's a struggle to speak at the moment. Oh, that's better. They were not confident that God would hear their prayers in those days. So they would you know, repeat prayers and maybe get louder so God could hear them. But we have that confidence, 1 John 5, 14, that if we pray according to his will, we have the confidence that he hears us. So today we know that God hears us. In the old days they weren't quite sure. They did not have, um, have access to God's word in those days. You know, we, we pray the word of God today because it's his will. In those days they didn't have the word of God. You know, there was no old, um, old Testament written. That was written afterwards. They had scrolls and things like that, but that was in the temple and only the priests could you know, read them anyway. So the people didn't have the word of God. We have the word of God, praise God. Now spiritual war- warfare in those days. <coughs> Daniel 10. This is a story of Daniel praying to God and not getting an answer for 21 days. Who's been there? They've prayed to God and they haven't got an answer. There's reasons for that. The, you know, the summary of that is that God immediately heard their prayer. The prayers weren't stopped in going to God, they were stopped in coming back. And, and, and God dispatched the answer straight away. But the prince, it says the prince of Persia, which is Satan, tried to stop the answer from coming back to Daniel. Michael was, you know, was sent up there. Michael the archangel was sent to fight with him. And it took 28, 21 days for Michael to win the war up in, up in the heavenlies. This is not on earth. So the answer would come back to Daniel. It took 21 days. I've waited longer than that sometimes for prayers to, to be answered. But you know, the, you know, the message was about end times. If you, if you read Daniel 10, I'm not going to go into that. Now we still have problems you know, with Satan here on earth, but the difference is today that is we have the name of Jesus. Jesus has given us his name to use. They didn't have the name of Jesus in those days. <clears throat> and God has given us weapons of our warfare in Ephesians 6. So if he's given us weapons, there must be a fight to fight. But we have the victory over him. I'll just read um, Ephesians six ten to 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. blood. We don't you know, fight against man. Excuse me. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against uh, a spiritual host of, of a wickedness in heavenly places. That's where we fight today in heavenly places. That's where the demons are. That's where Satan is. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. When's the evil day? The evil day is when Satan comes to you and tries to stop things, tries to make you sick and all that. And having done all to stand. So we're told that we, God has given us weapons, hasn't he? He's given us weapons to fight. And they're weapons that we win by. We, we, you know, we win. And, 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 and we put on the whole armour of God and we stand. And that, you know, we come against the devil that way. 
Now Paul, um, New Testament, New Covenant, Paul, Paul was hindered by Satan, which is in the church age we're talking about. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 18, it says, Therefore we wanted to come, he's talking about the church at Thessalonica, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan stopped Paul going to the church. He finally got there and he wrote you know, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Paul's thorn in the flesh in the flesh wasn't a physical disease, but it was in two Corinthians twelve seven a messenger of Satan that came to buffet me. <coughs> now, you know, there's a whole teaching on Paul's thorn, which I I may do. But Paul's thorn in the flesh wasn't wasn't eye disease. It wasn't sickness and disease. It was a messenger of Satan that came to buffet him. And he talks about, I forget where it is, in a couple of chapters before 12, I think, and he talks about being being shipwrecked, being whipped, being thrown out in the cold, uh, being persecuted by, you know, by fellow Christians. But that was Paul's thorn in the flesh. And so it says there a messenger of Satan came to buffet him to stop him doing what God had told him to do. So we we have those things things today. Satan Satan will stop you going to church sometimes. Like this morning, I, I felt like staying in bed, <laughs> and you think, oh well, I'm tired. I'll stay in bed. Yeah, that's not God telling you that. It's Satan. So we have to come against those things. But we, we have the weapons. Amen? Amen? Now fasting. Fasting is um, Bible fasting. Abstaining from food and drink in the ritual sphere of worship. That's what fasting was in those days. Fast, fasting was very common in the Old Testament. Jesus fasted, but he, he was still under the Old Covenant. In the epistles, which is the church age, not one time does the Holy Spirit tell the church to fast, nor are there uh, any directions given concerning fasting. But if you are led by the Holy Spirit to fast, that's okay. Who's fasted here? I've, I've, I've done it at once. It was about you know, for a weekend. I was trying it out, I didn't really understand it, but I was trying it out. But fasting doesn't change God. Fasting changes you. Why do we fast? We, you know, we fast, it says in uh, Acts there that they, you know, they fasted and prayed and waited on the Holy Spirit and then they laid hands on it was um, Saul and Barnabas, I think, and sent them out. So we can fast if we can lay hands on somebody you know, you know, to, to commission them. And, and we fast and draw, you know, we draw close to God in, in time of uh, trouble. We, you know, we fast to minister to God. Or you know, we fast to become more spiritual perceptive. It, it can increase the anointing on our lives if we fast. If you don't feel led to fast, then don't fast. But we need to, if you have the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit tells you to fast, we need to fast. Now you don't have to fast food and water. You can, you can fast from people for a weekend. I've done that before. Just shut myself off from everybody. You can fast from the TV. That's a good thing to do. Fast from the media. Yeah, you can fast from um, you know, from going out. Yeah, you know, you know, if you go out a lot, it's good just to stay home and get with the Lord. Kenneth E. Hagen said, you know, that he used to live a fasted life. He didn't fast as such, but he, he lived a fasted life. When should you fast? Or when you fast, 
have the, have the right motive to fast. Avoid long fast. I, I, was, I was reading, you know, you know, some of these weirdos overseas that you know, start a religion, they fast for two, three weeks and their, their mind goes crazy and they, they come up with you know, satanic you know, revelations about something. So it's good to fast for about three days, that's good. We can all, you know, we can all live with that. So, so when you fast, have a purpose for fasting. Don't just say, I'm going to fast. Have a purpose for it. That's the main thing. So fasting is good, but don't just do it because somebody else did. That's what I did when I first fasted. But, you know, everyone was fasting around. I said, oh, I'll try that. Mm. I got hungry. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we, um, we're just going to talk about the Lord's Prayer. Now, this, this might be a bit controversial, but, but, but if you have, have a problem with it, just check out what I say against the Word of God, and we'll see. Now, you know, you know, the Old Covenant extended right from the Old Testament through to the through to the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were still under the Old Covenant. And it, you know, the Old Covenant finished when Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished. That was the end of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant started. You know, it actually started in Acts, Acts 1 on the day of Pentecost. And it went right through the epistles to Revelation. Jesus came in the Old Covenant time to introduce the New Covenant, the church, to the people. But in Hebrews 8, 8 verse 6 it says, But now he has, he has obtained a more excellent ministry. This is Jesus. In so much as he, he is also the meditator of a better covenant which is established on better promises. So the New Covenant that we have today, we're living under the New Covenant, it is, is based on better promises than the old covenant that's good news isn't it yeah, yeah, so we can claim all the promises in the old testament plus all the new ones in the new covenant there for today in the sermon on the mount in Matthew 6 which is old covenant times you know, the Lord you know, was talking about the hypocrites hypocrites who prayed in public to be seen and he said that's the only, only reward they will get is to be seen by the people. So Jesus said that we should find a private place to pray. And then he said in Matthew 6 verse 8, Therefore do not be like them, talking about the hypocrites, for your Father knows the things that you have in need of before you ask him. In this manner therefore pray. And then he had the Lord's Prayer. And that's in Matthew 6, verses 9 to 16. Now, this is a beautiful prayer, and we can learn from it. Like, for example, the Lord's Prayer starts with praise and worship, and it finishes with praise and worship. It's a model prayer he taught his disciples for, for, for the interim period between the Old and the New Covenants. We are no longer in that period. I'll say that again. The, the Lord's Prayer was given for, for the, the, you know, the gap between the Old and the New Covenants. Now, the, you know, you know, what I'm going to say now is a bit controversial, but it's based on the Word of God, I believe. So the Lord's Prayer was given for, uh, to his disciples in that interim period. Now the, what, now, the reasons why this prayer is not relevant for today are many. And I'll just go through them and you can write it down the verses. It starts off with our Father in heaven. Now we are told to pray in the name of Jesus. There's no mention of Jesus there. In John 16 verse 23, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assured I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So the Lord's Prayer doesn't mention the name of Jesus at all. Now the second reason is in verse 10 it says your kingdom come. Well his kingdom has already come. 
isn't it? So we don't pray for his kingdom to come. It's already here. In Colossians 1.3, he has... And, uh, Peter mentioned this. He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So his kingdom has come in us. In Luke 17 verse 21, it says, The kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God is already here. So we don't have to pray for the kingdom to come. It's already here. The, the, you know, the third thing is found in verse 13. Lead us not into temptation, it says. It's talking to God. Lead us not into temptation. James 1 verse 13 to 15 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So God will not lead you into temptation. So we don't pray that God... Don't, don't lead me in temptation because God will not lead us into temptation. And it says, but he himself is tempted, it's talking about us now, but he himself is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So you're tempted when you are led away by the devil, you know, by your own desires. Now, now the last thing is in verse 13 it says, but deliver us from evil, or from the evil one. Now, Jesus has given us power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. God will not you know, deliver us from evil. We have the authorities to do that ourselves today. We have the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And he has told us in James 4 to resist the devil. Us resist the devil. Don't ask him to do it. We have to do it. In James four, it says, uh, "But you know, there's a there's a condition. We have to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you." So, so we don't ask God to resist the devil on our behalf. We have to do it ourselves. He's told us to resist, submit ourselves. That um, there's a lot of people leave this off. Submit yourselves therefore to God that's the key to submit to God resist the devil after we're submitted to God and he will flee from you hallelujah now the conclusion of all this our prayer life should be based on what God says if we if not, we cannot achieve a powerful and successful prayer life. So we need to do what God tells us to do. And he's told us how to pray in the new covenant. We don't pray like in the old covenant. We pray in the new covenant because that's where we're in. We pray in the name of Jesus. We have confidence that we know that he hears us because it says in 1 John 5.14. And we know if we pray according to his will, which is his word, that he's going to answer our prayers. Yes and amen. Hallelujah. So our, our prayer life, life should be based on what God says. All God's word is profitable, especially in the area of prayer. I don't know about you, but most of my prayers, I, I pray according to the word of God. I pray the word of God. I'll, um, I'll hand out next week or the week after some prayers that you can pray. Yeah, you know, the Ephesians prayers and Colossian prayers, Pauline prayers. They're all good prayers to pray all, and they're the word they're the, excuse me. They're the word of God. So we need to pray according to what the word of God says and then we'll have a more profitable and successful life. Amen. Amen. So Father God, I just thank you, Lord, that you have um, laid out in, in John especially, Lord, how we should pray. We pray to the Father in Jesus' name. We pray according to your will. And Father, we know that it's not going to take 21 days for the answer to come. It could be, yeah, because you answer our prayers. <coughs> Father God, we just thank you, Lord, that we can talk to you and, and just like a, a child does to the Father. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.